I'm not a professional fisherman, but I'd like to think of myself as a pro because I take it very seriously and I do it every chance I get. Let's just say I go fishing anytime I'm not at my day job. In a similar fashion, I have fished in many places, but my favorite places to fish are rivers and lakes, and in my state, that usually means going to the mountains. I'm very good at what I do. I never come home without some fresh trout in my hand. So when I returned from this particular trip without any fish, my wife was very confused as to why. I've never experienced anything like this before, and I've been to the mountains countless times. I know the wildlife. I know the layout of the land. But what I saw on that trip made me fearful to ever return. It was getting close to late fall, early winter, when I decided to take a few days trip up into the mountains. It's really my last hurrah for the year. I wanted to stock up for the winter. I took four days off, but I only planned to be gone for two. I love being outdoors, but not when it's frigid, so I wanted to come back home in decent weather. I packed up my things and said my farewells, and I started driving towards my favorite fishing spot. The wind was pretty cold, but the sun was out and shining, and the sky seemed pretty clear. Getting to my favorite fishing area was a bit of work because it's not easy to find unless you know where you're going. It's not much of a fork in the road, but it looks like it if you look hard enough. And I always take the less driven path to the left, the way you can't easily spot. I don't really take people to this spot. It was a secret fishing area that my dad would take me to, and I like to keep it private. Anyways, I take the left path on the fork in the road, and I drive a ways until I see a small clearing and the river. I unload all my things, including my tent. I get my hooks in the water as quickly as I can. Being up there usually gives me time to avoid thinking too much. I usually watch the ripples in the water, or I watch the sky change colors. I hadn't gotten a bite by the time the sky started changing pink. I was growing a little frustrated, but I knew I'd have the next day, especially that early morning to catch something. I caught myself really looking at the trees for the rest of my time. They just looked really nice in the lighting. I'm kind of mad I hadn't really noticed them before. So anyways, I'm looking at the trees across the river from me. There's plenty of them to hide something like a deer or what have you. But the trees weren't very tall, especially not by the riverbed. A lot of the trees had burnt down a few years prior, so there were areas that seemed to be a little more bare than nature intended. It seems like I'm babbling, but a lot of this is really important for you to understand. You see, I'm as skeptical about things as anyone, but what I saw wasn't a deer or a bear. As I'm looking out towards the trees across the river, I can see between the trees, especially towards the tops of the smaller trees closest to me. But going back, it seemed to get more dense, and then a little beyond that, it was sparse again. There were holes, you know, gaps between the dense trees. Anyways, I'm looking out and I see something that looks low to the ground. It's in the sparse area several feet from the river but there's a lot more trees in front of it than I realize. At first, I thought I'm looking at a bear cub, something small and dark, much darker than a deer, and it's not really moving, so that seemed odd. I'm not a scientist, but I do know that bears don't really sit idle. They move, especially little clubs. They've got places to be. So the longer I'm looking at this dark, hairy mass, the more I'm starting to wonder what it's doing. I notice my fishing pole starts to rattle a little, so I reach my hand out to grab it. As soon as I do this movement, I notice the dark thing moves, so my reflexes cause me to look back up towards it. The thing was much closer now, standing in front of the dense area that was hiding it before. As I said, the trees in front of the dense area were pretty short, so when this thing moved forward, I could see that it was much larger than I thought. It seemed to be standing on its hind legs, but it was crouching down to meet the tops of smaller trees. The only reason I know this is because I could see what appeared to be fingers wrapping over the tops of its knees. Aspen trees don't have much to them, especially not near the base. So even though the thing thought it was hiding, I could see lots more of it than it must have thought. 
What really freaked me out were the eyes looking at me from atop of that small tree. They were dark, just like the hair on it, but they seemed much more deep, like they were curious. It didn't seem threatening at first, so I tried to walk closer to the river without looking away. But as soon as I stepped closer, it stood straight up and disappeared back into the dense trees behind it. That thing towered over the juvenile aspen. If I had to guess, I'd say the aspen was around four or five feet tall, and this thing was nearly twice its size. But it glides into the trees with ease, like it was used to be hidden away, despite how big it was. I know it sounds crazy, but whatever it was looked more human than a beast, especially in those eyes. And with that, I decided to pack up all my things and go back home. I didn't even spend the two days that I had planned. Greetings, Donovan. I love your channel. It's always given me a thrill hearing about the scary happenings people have experienced in the secluded parts of the world. I can't say I ever expected to have one of those experiences myself, but I did. I live in the heart of Philadelphia, a few blocks north of the center city, just before it starts to get too sketchy. It's always busy and always crowded, so I never expected to come across anything like what I've seen in your videos. It all happened on what was easily the worst day of my life. I've had some issues with drinking throughout my life, and I'm proud to say that I've been three years sober. This past February, I almost poured it all down the drain. I was in Fairmont near where my girlfriend and our son live with her parents. Both her mom and dad are lawyers that work for a law firm that defends other lawyers. So they live in a real nice townhouse on North Woodstock Street, right behind the Eastern State Penitentiary. If you're not a Philly native, you've probably still heard of the old prison. It was once the most expensive prison in the world and held notorious criminals like Al Capone, but is now just a historic landmark most famous for being an elaborate haunted house around Halloween. I didn't live with my girl and son because we couldn't all fit in my tiny apartment, and her parents were not a big fan of mine. It sucked, but the schools around her parents' neighborhood were fantastic, and I wanted to give my son the best chance he could at not being a screw-up like me. Me and my girl were having a knockdown drag out fight that night, and we broke up. I was in a bad place. I stormed out of the house and walked down Fairmont Avenue looking for a place to drink. Sobriety didn't matter to me anymore. It was still too early for most of the bars to be open, and I wanted to get a whole bottle to myself anyways. So I headed to the nearest store. Unfortunately at the time, but fortunately for me in the long run, the closest store was not open. I was beyond annoyed, so I kept my eyes peeled for a bus station so I could leave the neighborhood. I found one at the end of the street and waited impatiently in the cold. I was still simmering from my fight with Michelle, so I really didn't care anymore where I went. I was intent on jumping the first bus that came by and getting away from the area. A SEPTA bus finally came rolling down the street, but the LCD display board on the front of the bus was blank. It didn't show any destination. Normally, they say off-duty if they're not on route, so I assumed it was just busted. It rumbled to a stop at the bus stop. I walked towards the door, but the unmarked bus started to speed off. I was pissed and chased it down the street. I picked up cans and gravel off the street and threw them at the back of the bus. After about a half a block, the bus stopped and the door opened. I was surprised. I didn't expect it to stop after the hissy fit I just threw and I wasn't sure if I should actually get on. My anger from the fight with Michelle overtook my caution, and I walked onto the bus. I tried to pay, but the driver just smiled and jerked his thumb to the back, indicating for me to take a seat. By all accounts, the bus looked normal, but everything was off. It was all so indistinct. I still can't picture the face of the driver. I couldn't tell you his hair color or really anything. I sat near the back of the bus. There weren't many people in the bus, but everyone I passed looked just as miserable as I did. Like this bus was a vehicle for people at their lowest point, I didn't see a single smiling face on the entire bus. We rode for hours, passing indistinct neighborhoods. It all looked familiar, but I couldn't place any local landmarks. 
It felt like I was touring a movie set built to look like Philadelphia, but wasn't the actual city. I felt an overwhelming sense of lethargy. I wasn't even bothered about where we were going. Occasionally, we would stop, and someone would just stand up and get off. The people getting off looked surprised to be leaving. These looked like random spots, but those exiting the bus clearly knew their surroundings. As we drove, I replayed the argument I had with Michelle over and over again in my mind, realizing what I should have said or shouldn't have said. Maybe I had been too harsh and defensive. Maybe I need to be more understanding. We only picked up one person while I was on the bus. It played out very closely to how I got on. The bus stopped and then sped off, leaving the poor soul to chase us down the street. What really struck me, though, was how he seemed to be the only one in the crowd to notice us. There were other people at that bus stop, but they didn't seem to notice us rolling in. Hours or days later, I honestly couldn't even tell you. I had an epiphany. It was a crystallizing moment of clarity, where I knew exactly what I had to do. Just as the thought burst into my mind, the bus stopped. I looked out my window and realized we were back on Fairmont. The look of surprise on the other passengers' faces, just before they got off the bus, suddenly made sense to me. I ran off that bus and knocked on the door to my girlfriend's place. She ripped the door open instantly, like she had been standing right at the doorway. Her clothes were the same as when I left her, and everything looked exactly as it had when I left. I told her everything that went through my head on that strange bus, and we're still together to this day. I don't understand what happened, but I know it somehow gave me a second chance. I never did believe in the supernatural. Truthfully, I still don't. Maybe that's why it's so hard for me to square away what I saw in 06. It's like a black stain on my perfect portrait of faith. It's something I can't explain. I hope that you can. If not, maybe you can point me towards someone with a theory. All of my theories have run their course. Do you remember 06? An ice storm came through central Illinois that shattered trees and encased entire houses. We had to chisel our way out of the front door. The way I remember it, we got hit at the tail end of November or the first week of December. It's hard to say. Either way, for the next month, we were in a purgatory of ice. Then, we got hit again in January. That one, I'm sure you remember. It wasn't exclusive to any one state. Most of North America felt that one. For a while, it seemed that winter wasn't going to end. Global warming had really come for us, huh? Of course, it did end. The ice melted and we went back to our usual lives, forgetting that more than 70 people were killed by that ice. Is 70 a lot? It feels like a lot. Either way, this story isn't about those 70 people. Maybe it should be. I know we've had some storms just as bad since then, and it never feels like the country is really prepared. I don't want to get into politics, though. I don't want to talk about how much our taxes go towards crisis spending, and I definitely don't want to debate the existence of global warming. I don't drink myself to sleep every night trying to forget that the ice caps are melting. I'm trying to forget what I saw. We had a few weeks to prepare, right? A few weeks when we all talked about the weatherman and doubted that his predictions of the record-setting low temperatures would come true. We doubted him, but we emptied the stores anyways. We all do a bit of panic shopping, don't we? We hear we might be stuck indoors, and suddenly, all we can think of is hoarding as many resources as we can. Stock up the cupboards, fill the fridge, stack the cans in the basement. It was right after Thanksgiving. I remember because I was looking in the fridge, trying to decide whether or not my leftovers would carry me through the storm that was coming. I decided to grab a few groceries in the middle of the night just to be safe. I didn't count on the main roads being closed. I didn't count on the detour keeping me out so late. I certainly didn't think the storm would arrive while I was behind the wheel. It did. I ended up parked on the side of the road. My hazard lights reflected in the falling snow and ice, illuminating the area around me one beat at a time. Each time the light blinked on and unveiled the world around me, the road and the fields were covered by more freezing white. 
I was being buried. Luckily, by then, I had grabbed my groceries. I zipped up my jacket and worked my way through a candy bar. It turns out stress eating can't save you from a blizzard. I started the car to run the heat and recharge the battery. As the engine hummed back to life, my hazard lights briefly stopped blinking. There was a pause in the rhythm. It was brief and only lasted for a single moment while the car fired back up. But in that brief moment, before the hazards and the headlights could shine, another light blinked back at me. I cut the engine immediately. I pressed the triangular button that toggled my emergency lights and I held my breath. Whatever blinked at me, it came from the sky. The helicopter? Not in that weather. I rubbed my eyes and took a deep breath, telling myself that stress was overwhelming me. All of the shadows from the storm had caught me by surprise. When I looked back through the windshield, the light blinked again. This time, it was closer. This time, I saw where it was coming from. Easily the diameter of a train car. It was floating above the road. It didn't move. It didn't make a sound. The wind and the snow and the ice didn't seem to touch it. The smooth black surface was unmarked by the winter. From my position on the road, I could only make out a single obstruction on its polished circular frame. There was a large indentation, also circular, facing my direction. It felt like I was looking at the hollow socket of a skull. It felt like there was an eye there, something watching me that I couldn't see. The light blinked again, shining from that indentation and blanketing my car. It swallowed the vehicle and blinded me. I felt the frame rumble and grabbed my steering wheel until my knuckles turned white. Something lurched underneath me, like the car was being lifted from the ground. I swayed in the mean winter wind, then I fell. The vehicle crashed back onto the pavement. It must have only risen an inch or two, but it was enough to shake me to my core. My head bounced when I looked up. The light and the object in the sky were gone. I didn't die out there. I didn't wind up one of those 70 people. I know that makes me lucky. But I have spent every day since wondering what that was. What did it want? Why did it stop to look at me? Was it satisfied with what it saw? So it dropped the car and spared my life. Or was it disappointed? So it cast me back into the storm and let Mother Nature decide my fate. Like I said, I don't believe in the supernatural. I need you to tell me what was natural about what I saw that night. Do you know how affordable it is to fly to Indonesia? $40 for a ticket to the international airport in Medan. $40 more and a five-hour drive to Bucket Lawang, and that's it. You're in the heart of Indonesia. At least you're in the area I think of when I think of Indonesia. In every direction, a sea of green. I always wanted to experience the rainforest firsthand. $100 earned me a two-day trek through the jungle with two experienced guides and all the sightings of wildlife that I could imagine. I hope when we first began our journey that I would see at least one Sumatran orangutan. They were the reason I came, honestly. Orangutans had always been my favorite animal, and I wanted to see one in person, in its natural habitat, before their critically endangered status became any bleaker. I donated where I could to help the conservation efforts, of course, but it's hard to feel like you're making a difference when you're only one person. Looking back, I wonder if I took the trip to Indonesia because I needed to rekindle my fighting spirit or because I had already given up on saving this species. It doesn't matter. In the end, neither the orangutans nor myself became the biggest part of my story. Although, I guess it did start with one orangutan in particular. We were only an hour into the first day's trek when the lead guide raised his flat palm toward me. I stopped immediately, and the second guide, who had been following in the rear, ran ahead to join him. They pointed to the trunk of a large tree, where the vines had wrapped a coil around it and formed a second shell. Whatever they were discussing, I couldn't see it. It was just a tree as far as I was concerned. Then they waved me forward. I approached slowly, exactly as they instructed, and soon my eyes landed on the object of their fascination. Around the rear side of the tree trunk, the layer of vines swelled out to create a hollow dome. 
Inside that dome, through the bar-like vines, I saw something large and hairy. The Sumatran orangutan. I think I yelped. I was so excited. The guides both glared at me until I quieted down. I hadn't realized it yet, but the orangutan at the base of the tree was frightened. It was hiding. Every few moments, it would peek its head out from behind the vines and glance upward. We followed its vision to the canopy, but couldn't see anything out of the ordinary. No other primates, no predators. The orangutan was trembling. It didn't even notice that we were standing there. The guides ensured that we gave the animal plenty of space and we continued on our journey. I asked if that kind of encounter was odd. It felt odd. They didn't answer. We stayed silent for a long while after that, only chatting when the guides stopped to point out our first sighting of a particular plant or animal. It was all fascinating, all beautiful, but I couldn't shake the memory of the wide-eyed orangutan from my head. When the sun began to set, we heard the beast that had scared that poor orangutan. Far above us, something in the canopy howled. Now, I'm no expert, but in the time since this encounter, I've tried to identify that howl. The best way I can describe it is somewhere between a cry of a wolf and a chimpanzee. It was loud, high-pitched and long-winded. When the call finally faded, we all stood frozen in place. The guides didn't need to explain that they'd never heard anything like that. I could see it in their slack-jawed expressions. We watched the tops of the trees, searching for the shadows for the source of that strange howl. We didn't want to move and risk provoking the animal that we couldn't see. Then, something in those shadows moved. The entire canopy seemed to sway as the thing in the darkness shifted above us. Whatever it was, it was large enough to bend those trees without a grunt of effort. I remember asking if we should run. Instead of answering, one of the guides broke into a sprint. I followed him leaving the other one frozen in place. I like to think the guide we left behind got out of that jungle just fine. After all, the beast chased the two of us. Branches cracked and dropped from the sky, turning the dense tree limbs into a rain of foliage that fell at our heels as we ran. The creature was massive and powerful enough that it didn't need to be graceful. I tried to catch a glimpse of the animal when I could. Looking over my shoulder every dozen paces as I tried to keep up with the guide ahead of me, I saw these leathery red wings, the length of a car. I saw this long snout and pointed teeth, dark eyes the size of my clenched fists, and feet with these hook-shaped claws. I know that the two of us felt like the shadow of death was upon us. The creature felt inescapable, and the jungle felt like it would stretch on forever. But just as quickly as it came the beast was gone. The only explanation, as far as I'm concerned, was that we had wandered into its territory. Maybe it had recently moved into a part of the forest and didn't want any intruders, human or orangutan. The guide refunded me and didn't say a word. I had questions that I didn't know how to ask. Instead of asking them, I just went home. The heart of Indonesia, I learned, was a dangerous place to be. I know answers aren't coming, not without going back. It's a cheap flight, remember? Tell me you want to see what I saw, and I'll take you to the place where I found death in the jungle. This happened a few years ago when I was still in high school. I'm in college now. We all decided to do what normal, bored, suburban high school kids do when we hear about a place that we aren't supposed to go to. We got wind of an abandoned psychiatric hospital a few cities over. Urban legend had said it was haunted and creepy. As you know, people had gone crazy exploring it. Naturally, myself and my three friends needed to check this place out. I mean, I didn't believe in all the rumors and whatnot, but then again, it'd be pretty great if something did happen. So we got our flashlights and a couple of cameras. We charged our phones and got our backpacks and got everything ready for the weekend to go check this place out. There were pictures online of the place, but they were all during the day. We needed to go at night, the middle of the night if we could. The pictures were pretty crazy. It was old, run down, but I needed to see it in person, experience the place for myself. Apparently, the cops did monitor the place, so we had to be on the lookout for that too. I was not looking forward to being arrested or whatever. I don't need that in my life. 
We decided to go on a Sunday instead of a Saturday. Saturday is usually way more busy, you know? Whereas Sunday, people aren't out as much. At least, that's what we all decided. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Anyway, my friends came over, and we piled into my car and left my house around 10 p.m. It took about 45 minutes to get to the city of Northville, another couple of minutes to get to the hospital. I'm not going to lie, it was pretty creepy, especially at night. And I'm not the type to get creeped out by anything. It was big and janky looking. Broken windows, boarded windows, overgrown grass. It was like out of a movie. I just kind of laughed when I saw it. We kept our flashlights off going up to the building. We hadn't seen any cops, but we weren't used to the area. We weren't really sure where they hung out. I mean, they have to drive by every so often, right? We found some broken windows to get into the place. It wasn't hard. I used the light on my phone and my two friends used flashlights. They tried to point them towards the ground so that the light wasn't too bright. My other friend held his cameras to take pictures and video of our exploration. Everything was dingy and dirty and the paint was peeling off the walls. A lot of the tiled floors were cracked and broken. Things would crunch under your feet when you walked in certain areas. There was furniture and all kinds of stuff left behind. We found a room with stacks of old paint cans, piled up almost to the ceiling. There were old cafeteria tables folded up, tables covered with old papers and plastic containers, a room filled with like a dozen fridges. It was really weird. Like, why would you just leave all this stuff for years? There's like graffiti everywhere on the walls, like all over the place. We took a bunch of pictures of it. There was one room that had, you're not getting out alive, painted in red on the walls. That kind of freaked us out, and we just kind of laughed it off. There was one area, though, that had, I love you, on a brick wall, and that's when stuff started to get kind of weird. We're standing there taking a picture of the wall, when we swear we hear footsteps down the hall. We just stop and look at each other, and my friend Steph gets all wide-eyed. I'm trying not to laugh, and my other friends are shushing me. So I go and I look down the hallway, and I can't see anything. I mean, it's a super old building. It could be anything. And with the graffiti on the walls, people obviously come here from time to time. So we keep going. We find a couple of rooms with broken glass all over the floor and some abandoned wheelchairs and old bed frames. We come across one room with a metal table in the middle of the room with cabinets lining the walls. There's like holes in the table and a rubber hose attached to it. I don't know what the hell this was used for, but... We take some pictures of it, and we hear the footsteps again. We look at each other, and I swear I heard some whistling. I go and stick my head out the door and look around. I don't see anything, and now I don't hear anything. My friends started to get kind of panicky at this point, so we walk out into the hall, and then we hear something creaking, like a door or a window. That made my buddy Rob jump, and I almost bust out laughing. He stops, though and stares into his camera and points at the screen on it. We all crowd around him and see this shadow like moving down the hall. I shine the flashlight down the hall and there's nothing. I look back at the screen and it seems like the shadow is still moving down the wall of the hallway. Well, that was it. That sent my friends into full freakout mode and they take off down the hallway. I go running after them and we hear like loud crashing behind us like things are either being flung around or smashed into each other. I don't really know. We find a room with smashed out windows and we head outside. We were all freaked out and turned around, so it took a second to figure out which way the car was. But we ran the entire way. That shadow was shaped like a man with a long coat, I think. Some of my other friends thought it was a lady with a dress on. I really don't know, but it was definitely a crazy night. And none of my friends ever want to do anything like it ever again. It was Christmas Eve and I was running late to dinner at my parents' house. It was my first year working in retail over the holidays. And everyone and their extended families were buying last-minute gifts. I didn't expect my shift to run that far over. No rest for the wicked, I guess. My family usually gets cheap Chinese takeout for Christmas Eve. Not very exciting, I know, but I was looking forward to it regardless. 
I had planned to have at least an hour to go home, take a shower and make myself look presentable, but I would have to leave right from work if I wanted to make it to the party at all. It started snowing the last hour of my shift. Not enough to stick to the roads, but enough to make things pretty slippery. Great, I thought. That's just what I need. As if I wasn't already late. The drive to my parents would take about 40 minutes, but it likely would be an hour with the snow. I closed the store with another co-worker and got my car. The snow was falling in big flakes now. The parking lot was a little slippery driving, but the streets had been salted. Maybe I wouldn't be as late as I had thought. I soon left the city streets and headed towards the dark country roads. My parents didn't live in the middle of nowhere or anything, but I had to drive through a couple of towns to get there, mostly on state highways surrounded by farmland. The snow was falling heavily by now, and visibility wasn't great. I remember snow sticking to my windshield wipers and freezing, so much so that I had to pull over and try to clean them off. I wasn't quite sure where I was. The visibility was pretty bad. It looked like I was near the game farm, but I couldn't tell for certain. The game farm is a big waterfowl area, super swampy and marshy. In the winter, it looks just like a normal field except for the barren swamp trees scattered throughout. I squinted through the snow to see if I could make out if those were swamp trees or not. If they were, then I was only about 10 miles away from my parents' house. As I was looking out at those trees, I thought I saw lights glowing from the other side of the road. They were small, sort of a reddish yellow, just the two lights. I held my hand up to block the snow and to see if I could get a better look. By this point, I had recognized the game farm, but I couldn't see what these lights were. There was no way a person could be walking around out there. This was our first big snowfall of the season, and it hadn't been cold enough for the ground to freeze. Anybody out there would have fallen right into the swamp. The lights looked like they were moving closer to the road, but with the snow, I can't really say for sure. But that's what they looked like. I stood outside my car and watched them, trying to figure out what they could be. They went out once and then came back a second later, then twice, then three times. And then I realized they were eyes. The lights going out, whatever it was, was blinking. I jumped back in my car and locked the door. I watched it for a moment. I knew I should drive away, but I desperately wanted to see what it was. The eyes stopped moving towards me, but they stayed fixated on my car. I drove away and whatever it was didn't try to follow me. I had all but forgotten how late I was to Christmas Eve dinner. The only thing I saw was its eyes. I didn't even see a shape of an outline or its body. I can say that it looked to be around my height, about five and a half feet tall. The snow was still falling steadily. And while I was driving slowly, I was confident that I left the creature with the glowing eyes far behind me. But I didn't even make it a half mile before something ran into the front of my car. I didn't hit the brakes because I didn't want to slide off the road. It looked big, maybe a deer. I didn't hit it, but I saw something move in the ditch on the other side of the road. I pulled over, but I didn't want to get out of the car after the incident at the game farm. So I just watched in my side mirror to see if anything in the ditch moved. It was hard to see through the snow, but it looked like this creature was getting up. It stood up on two legs, and for a split second, I thought I had just almost hit a person on the road. But then, I saw its eyes. Those same reddish, yellowish eyes from the swamp. There must be two of them, because there's no way that one could have gotten here so fast. I was driving slow, but I was still going at least 45 miles per hour. But as soon as it stood up and shook off the snow, I realized how it could have gotten here so fast and how it ran right in front of my car without getting hit. It had wings, like bird wings. I don't know. It was hard to see in the snow, but, but it for sure had wings. It was too dark to see its face, but I saw its eyes and its wings. I drove dangerously fast the rest of the way to my parents' house. I'm surprised I even made it. And thankfully, this creature didn't follow me again. I don't have any other explanation for it. And I haven't ever seen it again since that night on Christmas Eve. Hey there, Donovan. I'm from upstate Wisconsin, and I've got a story that I think you'll want to hear. And maybe help me out. I don't know. I don't really know how to fix this. 
I'm a doctor and I work in a town of maybe 700 people. Our closest neighbor is an active army base. Sometimes I'll get visitors from there if their hospital is too busy, or they'll send a nurse or two over to help me out. The point is, I've got a good working relationship with that base. I have a patient who I'll refer to as Sharon, and she's a military wife. She came to see me once because of a health emergency. At the time, the base was too far out of reach. She's been my patient since then. I had her for a little over five years now. The thing about Sharon is that she's a pretty level-headed person. She doesn't make a big deal out of things. So when she came to me and said that she was concerned for her husband, Cole, I took her at her word. She said that Cole had gotten the flu and wasn't recovering like he was supposed to. He had been bedridden for three weeks. She took him to the VA hospital and he got released the next day, even though he wasn't any better. This immediately seemed strange to me. I trusted that VA hospital and honestly, it was one of the better ones I'd seen. It wasn't like them to shirk their duty like that. And worst of all, my hands were tied. I wasn't Cole's primary care, so I couldn't write him a prescription. I couldn't do anything except give Sharon some tips and ask her to keep me updated. I felt terrible. She came back two days later and said Cole had recovered to full strength. I was as confused as she was. For him to make a turnaround like that after being sick for so long was bizarre. I told her to keep an eye on him just in case. Then Sharon called me around midnight on my emergency number. She said that Cole was awake but unresponsive. We did a video call on my cell phone and I saw what she meant. He was sitting up in bed with his eyes open, but he didn't react when she talked to him, touched him, nothing. He was ignoring her. He was a serious man and he didn't play jokes like that. It was like he didn't see her at all. I thought he had a mental break of some sort or something in his brain had gone wrong from the flu. Sharon had tried calling the VA and been blown off each time. I told her to drive Cole to my office and I would do all I could. They didn't even make it off the base. Sharon was turned back when she tried to leave. We were actually on the phone at the time because she had put me on a video call and left me on mute. I couldn't see much because of the way she hid in the phone in her purse, but I heard what was going on. A pair of officers argued with her and wore her down even though they could all see the shape Cole was in. There was nothing I could do. The next day, one of the VA doctors came to my office. He was accompanied by a soldier. But that guy at least had the courtesy to stay in the waiting room. The doctor asked me about my relationship to Sharon. He wanted me to turn over all my files on both her and Cole. I didn't have anything the VA hospital wouldn't already know about. And I had nothing on Cole at all. I told him so. He didn't seem convinced. There was nothing I could give him without violating a patient privacy law. That alone made his visit pointless. We both knew that, but I think he tried to bulldoze over me just to prove that he could. After that, I was scared to contact Sharon. I didn't want to get her into any more trouble with the army. Still, I didn't want to leave her on her own. Another two days passed before she was able to call me again. She said Cole had returned to normal and acting like nothing was wrong. He didn't seem to be in any pain, but as soon as the sun went down, he'd go quiet again. I told her she needed to time how long he was functional we had to figure out if he was awake for a set number of hours or if it was really linked to the nighttime. By this point, I was pretty sure this was some sort of medical experiment. Sharon was probably thinking the same thing, but neither of us risked saying it over the phone. I couldn't think of any way to help her. Another couple days passed when Sharon called me again. It was to say that Cole had been admitted into the VA hospital. She didn't know whether this would be the end of it or if he'd come out even worse. I didn't hear from her for weeks after that. No one else from the army came to my office. I got a letter from Sharon after a while. It wasn't much. She just let me know that Cole was okay and had been reassigned to a base in Illinois. All of this happened over the past fall. I haven't seen either of them since September and I don't know how they're doing. Sharon asked me to get in touch with some of her and Cole's family. And I have, but they don't know much more than I do. Thanks for listening. Maybe Sharon is out there listening too. I don't know. If they're out there, and I hope they are, I hope they're okay. I 
I was driving through Niagara Falls, Canada. It's an easier route than going through the states. Less traffic, speed limit seems to be not as high too, you know. Easy driving. I have a Ford Flex, a big SUV van hybrid deal. So I packed it up, threw the kids in it and the wife and headed out. We left early, around 3 a.m. I live outside of Detroit, so it took some time to go through the city and over the bridge. The city was pretty much empty at that time, even the freeway. It was nice to see the city without people for once, kind of eerie too, but quiet and peaceful. I rolled down the window a bit and just took in the early morning air. It was nice not to have to fight traffic, and there wasn't much construction being done, so none of the route was closed off or barreled off with construction barrels. The wife and the kids fell back asleep pretty fast. The kids, as soon as we backed out of the driveway, pretty much. My wife, after we went through security and over the bridge. Luckily, we weren't one of the random cars they stopped and searched. I stopped at McDonald's in Windsor, right next to the bridge to get some coffee for the road. And then I jumped right onto the provincial freeway heading out. It was great. There was hardly any traffic in the city and barely a soul on the highway. I could have counted the amount of cars I saw in one hand. It's just a nice easy drive and I'm not a fan of driving really. I've never really liked it. Don't get me wrong, I'll do it, especially on long trips like this. I just don't like traffic. I don't like the congestion, the stopping, the going, all of that. I like to take in the scenery, not to be bothered with stress and weights and people laying on their horns. I think most people were probably in agreement when it comes to that stuff. It's hard for some people to stay awake on the roads like this though. They tell you to watch out for other cars, and especially sleepy truckers. Keep vigilant and all that. I had the family, the coffee, so I was okay. There's also not very many lights on some of the more open stretches of the highway. Near towns and cities you're okay, but on open stretches, it's dark and hard to see at times. The first rest stop we hit after an hour on the highway, the kids stayed asleep. Me and the wife took turns hitting the bathrooms. Me especially after all the coffee. There's like no one really around. And yeah, those stops can be kind of creepy. And sometimes, you know, stuff happens at those rest stops. Anyway, I walked around the parking lot and around the car, stretching my legs after being the seat for so long. The air was nice and cool for once. It had been pretty hot that week. There were a couple of semis parked in the dark section of the lot. Two other cars seemed to be travelers like us, a family and an older couple. The rest stops are usually pretty brightly lit to attract the eye from the road, I think. After I walked around a bit more, I finally got back into the car and we headed out onto the road. It was another maybe half hour or 38 minutes tops, barren highway, nothing but open countryside on either side. I go to yawn and something dark moves across the road and I hit it. It's not deer season, it's June. What the hell did I just hit? That was my first thought. I don't know why, maybe because of the size of it, but again, it wasn't deer season, so what are the odds? Anyway, I slow down the car and get off to the side. My wife wakes up. I tell her that I think I hit something. Maybe a deer, maybe a dog, I don't know. I look in the rearview mirror and I don't see anything. It's still pretty dark out. There's not really any lights. Anyway, I decide to get out of the car and use my phone as a flashlight. I stop though because it's dark and it's early morning. I guess I kind of just froze waiting for something to happen. It's kind of a silly reaction, but it happens. And you feel kind of ridiculous. I guess I was waiting to hear something, maybe. Or wait for something to get up and move. I'm not really sure. But I just stood next to the car for a few minutes. Before I started to move super slowly back to see what I hit. I didn't see anything at first. But about maybe 10 feet from the car, I see a weird pale sack in some of the grass at the side of the road. I look around, shine a light and don't really see anything else. I walk up closer and the sack gets bigger and then the folds kind of move and I stop. This thing shoots out. I mean, it really moves and I drop my phone. I go to pick it up and follow where it's moving and I see arms and legs shuffling and this thing is taking off for a group of trees. I'm just standing there in shock, trying to make out what in the hell is this thing. What I thought was a pale like sack cloth is skin, I think. And this thing is traveling on all fours. I didn't get a good look at its face, but I saw these big black circles. Maybe its eyes. It was moving so fast it was hard to tell. 
I thought about going after it. I even moved up closer and down towards the trees. It didn't make any noise, but I could hear it moving through the brush. But I stopped myself thinking about my kids and my wife in the car. I just stood still, flashing my light near the trees trying to see something. I could hear it moving after a while too. It just got quiet and still. I heard my wife call out to me, but it took a few seconds to register. I just got back into the car and sat down. I didn't know what to think or what to do. I just told my wife it was nothing and started the car back up. It took maybe two days before I could tell my wife. She said she believed me. I don't know. I don't believe me. It was the strangest experience in my life. I still don't believe it at times. I spent this last summer working as a camp counselor near Rocky Mountain Park in Colorado. Well, I wasn't really a counselor, more of a camp aide. I helped the actual counselors maintain the camp and keep an eye on the kids. I don't want to give any names because I don't think the camp deserves any negative publicity for what happened. I had been attending this camp for the better part of a decade and knew some of the other kids and folks who worked there very well. I spent most of my time with these guys as I did my own parents. Every summer, like clockwork, I was shipped off to camp for all of July and half of August. I didn't really mind though. The counselors took really good care of the kids, and every day was kind of like a new adventure. Canoeing, hiking, and horseback riding was the norm, not to mention the nightly feast and campfire songs. It could be kind of cheesy at times, but everyone was always having a good time, so who cares? This summer, I was finally old enough not to have to go to camp, but I knew they were always looking for aids, and I didn't really have any other plans, so I took a job with the camp, knowing I was pretty much getting paid to do all the cool stuff I like to do anyway. It was about the end of the third week when this bizarre event occurred. The group I was with, made up of 14 kids, two counselors and another aide, had went out for the day for an extended hike. Now these kind of activities were for older kids at the camp, around 13 or 14, so you could imagine the noise level of this rambunctious caravan. We had left at 8 a.m., hiked five miles and stopped for lunch, preparing to turn around and head back afterwards. The kids were pretty ambitious that day, so the five miles was a good bit deeper than we would normally go. It wasn't really a big deal though. The counselors knew the area like their own living rooms, and the spot we stopped at had a cool spring which the kids took turns swimming in. I was sitting not too far away from the kids in the spring, eating lunch and just chatting with the other aides when we heard this sharp crack echo throughout the surrounding forest. All the activity in our little group stopped for a minute, and we heard it again followed by another crack, this time from a different direction. After the third crack, the oldest counselor in the group, we'll call him Benny, started scrambling to get the kids out of the spring and dressed. Me and the other aide were confused and a little unnerved to see him acting this way. Benny was an older guy, real outdoorsy and totally comfortable in the forest. Me and the other aide jumped up leaving our lunch sitting on a log and rushed over to Benny to figure out what was going on. Then we heard it. It was a deep bellow, not unlike a bear's roar, but I could have sworn that it was almost human. Whatever it was, it was answered by another bellow from where the other cracking noise had come from. Benny was screaming to run at this point and shouted for me to take point. I grabbed a few nearby kids and yelled for the rest to follow me moving fast back the way we had come. As we ran, I looked back a few times to see if we had everyone, but couldn't stop long enough to tell. I just hoped that Benny and the other counselor had gotten a head count. We ran nonstop for a good 10 minutes until I heard Benny from the back of the group calling for a halt. I was wheezing heavily by now. A full run through the mountain trail isn't like a jog on a paved street. There's roots, rocks, and a dozen other things that slow you down. And frankly, we were lucky nobody had fallen badly enough to get hurt or broken an ankle. Me and the other aide got it together enough to do a quick head count, while Benny and the other counselor went off to the side to talk. After confirming all the kids were with us, I went over to join Benny and the other counselor. I managed to catch the tail end of their conversation. I heard the other counselor saying to Benny that they should be a hundred miles away from here. And Benny responded, they must have moved further east, and that they've claimed this territory as their own. The rest of the conversation was cut short by a roar from nearby, 
followed by a thud and a scream coming from the main body of the group. Something had tossed a small boulder into the mass of kids, nearly taking the head off one of the boys leaning against a tree. There was a hysteria throughout the group, and the kids almost started running off in separate directions when Barry shouted commands and pulled everyone back together. The other camp counselor got the kids moving in a unified pack. As we all started running down the trail, I saw Benny cutting off from the group. All alone, he was yelling and slapping two sticks together like he was trying to make as much noise as possible. The rest of that trek back to the camp was one long blurry collection of running and stumbling and some infrequent stops. A few times the kids asked me what happened and where Benny went, but I didn't have answers for them. Near the point of exhaustion, we finally made it back to camp. The kids were all ushered to their cabins and all the aides were assigned a cabin to sleep in and watch over for the night. We were given strict orders to not, for any reason at all, leave the cabin or let the kids leave the cabin, unless a camp counselor physically entered the cabin and told us we could. We were even given a few buckets in case we needed to answer nature's call. When we woke up the next day, we were finally allowed out of our cabins. We were called for a general assembly. Benny had made it back to camp sometime in the middle of the night. He had cuts all up and down his left side of his body, and his arm was in a sling. He stood next to the camp director as he informed us that due to unnaturally aggressive bear activity, any activities outside of the camp would be suspended until further notice. The excitement died down over the next few days. Even without leaving the camp itself, there was still plenty to do, and since these kids' parents had paid for the full summer, we finished out the next few weeks. I got a nice paycheck, and then we went back home. About a month later, I received an email from the camp director telling me that next year's camping season was canceled. It would reopen the following year in a new location about 80 miles south. I live in a suburb of Los Angeles, right by a recognizable body of water. I'll leave it at that. The lake was a nice place to swim, it was a nice alternative to the salty ocean water and noisy beaches. I was a swimmer in high school and college before I joined the adult world and became a working stiff. It was a nice way to de-stress after a difficult day at the office. My town has a local legend. It was always just a silly joke that no one took seriously. Since I was a kid, I was told by teachers and adults that the lake was home to a terrifying sea serpent. It used to terrify us as kids but it became a draw to the lake. Tourists flocked to our small town, and it became an expensive resort town, hoping to see the serpent. The locals seemed to adopt this legend as enthusiastically as the tourists. My swim team even had the same sea serpent logo as the touristy t-shirts. It was a point of pride for us. We were the sea monsters. We're ferocious and we swim faster than you. That is always what it was to me. A silly story and a campy mascot. Any actual query into the existence of this creature was always seen as kind of dumb. It was like a conspiracy theory. Fun to talk about, but not that deep. Anyone who read that deep into this type of story was seen as a troll or making fun. Nothing too serious about it. The day of the incident was the hottest day on record. It was peak summer, and the humidity coming off the lake made it very uncomfortable to walk around. When I arrived at work, the unthinkable happened the air conditioner was broken. It had to be about 95 degrees at my desk, so a few co-workers and I found our way to a favorite nearby coffee shop and rubbed elbows around a tiny table. After what felt like an eternity, we made it to 5 p.m. My co-workers wanted to get drinks, but I decided to head home. I had enough of being in such proximity to all of them, and I really wanted some space. I was also dying for a swim. I said goodbye and went home. I changed into my bathing suit and got my bike out of the basement. I set out around the lake and made pretty good time. Slowly, the suburban sidewalks turned into a dirt path until I got to my usual swimming spot. It took some bushwhacking off-road, but the view of the city was beautiful, and it was a spot that was entirely unknown. I took my shirt off and left it by my bike and prepared for the swim. The water felt amazing on my legs, and I found myself immediately diving straight into the cool water. Relief flooded through me instantly. That thing I was craving all day felt so good. I finally cleared my head and started to relax. I was bobbing up and down a bit in the water at first and then I started treading water. 
I should have known something was off when I heard the frogs. Usually this was a quiet spot, but this evening it was like a symphony. It unnerved me slightly that they were so loud. It made something feel different about today. I don't know why, but the lake felt impossibly large, and I had never been smaller. Still, the water felt nice and I was dying to get my blood flowing. I started to work on my crawl stroke until I was almost at the center of the lake. I treaded water and began to float on my back. I closed my eyes for what must have been a second. I swear on my life, something swam past me. I know well the sensation of a swimmer going past you, and this felt the same, but it was fast and big. I righted myself in the water and looked around. Nothing, all was quiet. I took this as my sign to head back to shore, so I began swimming again. While crawling, I took breaths under my right arm, just as I was taught. As I neared the shore, I saw something. It looked like a huge eye, the eye of a fish. In my panic, I flipped around and righted myself once again. Nothing on the surface. I looked down, something gigantic much larger than me swam 20 feet under my legs. I looked hard in the water trying to make out its features. Whatever it was, it stopped some distance away from me. It had this long body like a snake and the head of a dragon I had seen on a television show. The water around me was still warm from how fast it passed me. Then in a moment, it dipped into the darkness of the lake. A few days have passed since then. I don't remember getting home, but I must have gone fast. I've been going about my days like normal, but no swimming. I began to do some reading to see if anyone had experienced what I had seen, or anything like that. That's how I found your show. I'd be so happy if you read this online. Maybe give me a little clarity to what I saw. I don't know when I'll swim again, but I'll be careful when I do. Thanks for watching and let me know what you think of these stories in the comments below. Don't forget that you can listen to my episodes on any of your favorite podcasting platforms. I try to upload every single day on this channel and on Donovan Dread 2, where I release shorter content. Same great encounters, just a little bit shorter. Also, if you want to see crazy encounters captured on trail cams, then check out Dread Captures. It's part of the Dread Network, where we go over live footage of very strange encounters that are sent into the Facebook group or videos that are circulating on the web. Last but certainly not least, check out Lilith Dread. She releases the same great content daily on her channel. You'll find all of these links below. Thanks and take care. This all happened a few years back, and some of the other rangers still give me crap about it, which kind of sucks because other than that, this is my dream job. My family took a trip up to the North Cascades National Park in Washington State. This was when I was 13, maybe. And I've known ever since then, this is exactly where I wanted to be. When I first got out here, the Parks Commission started me out in the visitor center, pretty much like everybody else. There's an awful lot of paying your dues and dealing with the public before you get to really spend some time out in the field, which is the main reason why folks get into this. It was my first week on active field duty, and I was over the moon. Basically, you work your way across sectors of the park, camping as you go and looking to see if there's any damage left behind by private campers. It's really a great excuse just to camp your way through some incredible terrain. Now, I just want to preface this by saying that Bigfoot is kind of an open joke among the rangers. The t-shirts and posters in the gift shop are always top sellers, and I can't tell you how many times people ask me if I'd ever seen one even before going out into the field. I can tell you now when folks ask that, everybody leans in. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Anyway, I was on duty. I was on my third day out on a scout, and I was combing my way towards Mount Shuxton. I was off the main trails, but sometimes you get really adventurous hikers out there, and they tend to leave a ton of crap behind. Whenever you're out there, you're bound to encounter a fair amount of wildlife but I was surprised how quiet things were. There really wasn't much going on, and it was starting to get downright eerie. The only wildlife I could see was a healthy flock of scavenger birds circling to the southwest, like a lot of birds, and that's a red flag, so I started making my way over and down to check things out. When I got to where they were, they were almost overhead. This overpowering stench took over everything. 
Something was definitely dead out there, and it had to be there long enough to really start to decompose. Gearing myself up to see a mule deer or something else, I pushed my way closer. Eventually, I saw something large through the trees, surrounded by a half a dozen turkey vultures. What really struck me odd was that none of them were on the carcass. They hopped around it, but it was like they didn't want to get close. Fighting through the stink, I finally got near to get a sense of the shape. At first, I thought it might have been a bear, but the reddish-brown fur wasn't a match of any species in the area, and I noticed the limbs were longer than the stocky bear legs. When I was right on top of it, I completely froze. This thing had the shape of a man, but it was massive. The shoulders had to have been the better part of four feet across, and I'd estimate the full height at between eight and nine feet, maybe as large as ten. But the desiccation made it hard to tell. The hands and feet were human-like, but the skin was darker than an orangutan or a gorilla. It was lying on its front, but the head was turned to the side. So I went around to get a look. It had this humanoid face. The eyes were gone, but the features were perfectly recognizable. I immediately started shaking because I knew that I was face to face with an actual Sasquatch. It was a dead one but this was undeniable proof that they existed. A whole rush of feelings went through me, and I was scared and giddy all at once. This was huge. I busted out my radio, but I couldn't get any kind of signal at that low point in the valley. As much as I hated it, I knew I was going to have to leave things behind and find a place where I could make contact with the other rangers. Clearing my head as best as I could, I looked around to memorize the location, then headed for higher ground. It was nearly a mile before I could get anything other than static. I was freaking out over getting so far from the carcass. At last, I reached one of my supervisors and told him what was up. He sounded about as incredulous as I've ever heard another person. But after about five minutes of begging, he agreed to send out a small team. I wanted to go back down, but he told me to hold in position so they could keep in contact and find me. I made camp and barely slept all night knowing these things could be out there. The next day, the three other rangers arrived. We hiked back down to the same spot where I seen the Sasquatch remains, and they were gone. The ground where it had all been still showed signs of animal decomposition, but the body itself was nowhere to be seen. They started after me and made all kinds of fun of me because I had made the call the day before April 1st. I filed a report, but they all said I was just pushing the joke and have never let me live it down since. But I swear what I saw was real, and I don't know how that body disappeared. This is an old story, but my family has me tell it almost every year. Some believe me and some don't, but that never really seems to impact how much they enjoy it. I hope you read it on your channel. There was a period of time back in the late 90s where I was the property manager for a building in downtown Houston. It was one of those places where different businesses or whatever would rent out floors or suites as their headquarters. My job was basically to be on hand and keep tabs on the cleaning stuff and generally be the go-between between between any of the renters and the owners. The place did really well overall, but they notoriously couldn't keep tenants on the fourth floor. I wish I could say something cooler like it was the 13th floor that was cursed, but this place only had 9 floors, so what can you do? We were coming into the fall, and yet again, some jerk had broken their lease on the 4th floor and moved out early. They had to be out by the 15th, and it was my job to make sure they adhered to the agreement. Anytime they stayed behind or left things killed our turnover in trying to get a new tenant for the top of the next month. To make things even better, we were just coming out of a spell where one of our cleaning guys would forget to pull the door shut after sneaking a smoke out back. That, plus downtown Houston in the 90s, meant I was forever chasing teenagers out of the place. It was a real treat. One night, the janitors were done, and I had made my rounds before locking up for the night. I crossed the parking lot to the far end where my car was, and just happened to look up from my keys to see a light on on the fourth floor, of course. Now, I might have uttered some words that aren't very nice to repeat, but after several nights that month running folks out of the place, I was in no mood for this kind of thing. 
especially as I already made my rounds, and this was just dragging me back inside. Regardless, I was going to have to deal with it. So, I go back in, and I take the elevator up. If I was doing my due diligence, I would have gone all the way to the top and worked my way down again, to make sure nobody was on the upper floors. But, I was in no mood. Besides, the lights were on the fourth floor, so the fourth floor is where I was going. When I got there, everything was bright, but nobody seemed to be around. Now, to set the scene a bit, the renters that left took all the furniture, but the phones and cubicle dividers belonged to the building. There were some that were still set up, but most were stacked against the walls. The creepy part in hindsight was that all the phones were on the floors, right where they had been set when taken off the desks. You could see the whole layout of their office structure just by where the phones were on the carpets. Anyway, I go from office to office making as much noise as possible to flush out whoever was monkeying around. Office after office, no dice, nobody in sight. On other nights, I might have gone through the entire building again, but I refer you to my former statement of being in no mood. After establishing the floor was clear, I just turned off the lights and made my way back to the elevator. I hit the button and stood there, fuming. Then, all in a second, I knew I wasn't alone up there. I turned around and saw a man walk out of the corner office at the far end. He was dressed like something out of a 1950s newspaper movie or the show Mad Men, suit, tie, and fedora. He saunters to the dead center of the room opposite me and turns to stop. That's my cue to start yelling every name in the book at this guy. I start for him in a full-on huff, and he just does this kind of lazy walk towards me. Something about how calm he is only makes me angrier. I've crossed maybe a quarter of the room when something in my brain starts telling me that something's not right. All the lights have been cut off, but he steps into a beam spilling up from the lights in the parking lot, and that's when it all comes into place. He's got no face. I immediately start walking backwards because there's no way I'm turning my back on this, whatever it is. The elevator opened and closed while I was yelling at this guy. I reached back to hit the button, praying like hell that he hasn't gone back down into the lobby. The elevator opened and closed while I was yelling at this guy, and I reached back to hit the button. He keeps getting closer, and just when he's about 15 feet from me, every phone in the place starts ringing even the ones that aren't plugged in. I feel like I'm going to have a heart attack at this point. The doors behind me open, and I just step backwards into the light of the elevator and hit the closed doors button. The guy approaching hasn't changed his pace at all, and the doors close just as his nothing face reaches the threshold. I book across the lobby, lock up the doors, and basically dive into my car. We secured a tenant within the next few days, and they moved in almost entirely by the 25th. I have no idea if they stayed on long term, as I handed in my resignation before the end of the month. I inherited my father's farm a few years ago and moved in shortly after with my family. I didn't grow up living with my father. My mom had full custody, and I would visit the farm from time to time, but I never lived there. The house was far back from the road and surrounded by these cornfields on all sides. There was this large two-story barn where there were a few goats, but it was mostly for storage. The house itself was a two-story house with these large windows and a nice wraparound porch. Honestly, it seemed like the perfect place to raise a family. I was excited to move in and give my kids a good childhood. I had no experience with farm maintenance, so there was quite a learning curve for me. It took a while to start getting the hang of it, but eventually I did and I really enjoyed the work. It was nice being outdoors and feeling the sun on my back while I worked. I didn't know much about tracks or footprints, but when I'd be walking through the cornfield, I noticed some tracks on the ground. They looked like paw prints to me. Maybe they belonged to a large dog or something. I kept seeing them for a few weeks. Every day I'd see fresh tracks but there was no sign of the animal otherwise. One morning, I got up extra early to do my work because it was going to be 105 degrees that day and I wanted to beat the heat. When I was outside, I heard some rustling in the corn. I looked back and saw it moving behind me. I was a bit alarmed because I was out there alone without anything to protect me. 
I was just hoping it wasn't some wild animal. I looked all around me and saw that there was corn moving behind me too. I needed to get out of there so I booked it to the barn and turned around to see if it was still moving. I saw the movement going further away from where I was. I was a little confused. I thought it would have chased me but I was glad it didn't. I kind of assumed it was the dogs that had been walking around the field and didn't think much more about it. A few weeks passed and I hadn't seen anything. I kind of thought the dogs had gone away. But one night, when I was sitting on the porch relaxing, enjoying the nice cool night, I saw the corn rustling again. I stood up and grabbed a shovel that was near me on the porch, and I started walking towards it. As I approached, it quieted down. I could just make out between a few stalks of corn, this dog-like creature staring at me. I dropped down to my knees and slapped my leg to call for it. When I did, it took off in the corn and didn't look back. I noticed it had this very strange gait. I couldn't see it very well, but it almost looked like it was limping. The following night, I made sure to stay out late again to try to see if it would return. I heard more rustling in the corn, but not from in front of the house. This time, it sounded like it was near the barn. I walked down there carrying the shovel in my hand again. I flipped on the light of the barn, and I was horrified when I saw one of my goats walking around with a bite in its neck. I rushed to it and took off my shirt and put pressure on it. I yelled for my wife hoping she could hear me and to call for the vet for an emergency appointment. She came running out shortly after and called. I rushed the goat to the vet and they were able to save him. But whatever it was that did that needed to go. I waited in the barn the following night, this time with a machete we had lying around in the house. I wasn't going to let this dog ruin my happy life on this farm. The rustling noise sounded again. I hid inside one of the barn stalls. I watched as this creature walked into the barn and stalked around. It was sniffing in the air, which I thought it must have been sniffing for the blood from the other night. In the barn, it didn't look like a dog. It didn't even look like something of this world. It was on all fours and its eyes were large and shimmering black. I thought I'd be scaring off some wild dog, not facing some scaly creature. I watched it as it sniffed the air and took notice of me. I waited in the stall and saw its feet coming closer. I kicked the stall open and heard a small squeal coming from this creature and ran back into the house. I told my wife to put the kids to bed and I told her all about what I saw. I think she thought I was crazy at first, but I got my point across. I didn't know how to get rid of this thing or even if I could. So we ended up rehoming the goats. They all got placed on nice farms with a lot of other goats and farmers more equipped to take care of them. Ever since we rehomed the goats, this creature stopped coming by. We have no cattle or livestock, just corn. And I suppose it's not interested in just corn. I've been a park ranger for 15 years. I worked most of that time in the Ponderosa Forest of Arizona. But a few years ago, I headed back up north. My family is from Twin Falls, Idaho. My parents are getting older, so I wanted to be closer to check on them more often. I got a post about Craters of the Moon National Monument. I had a research position, so I was moving into a pretty remote station. It was quite a distance from the nearest town. After I moved in, it seemed like things kept going wrong. The solar power was glitchy and wasn't working half of the time. My sleep was suffering from weird disturbances. There were a lot of species of bats there, which was fine, but they kept getting into my cabin somehow. I kept getting awakened by the flapping and squeaking, and I couldn't find how they were getting in. I lived in the middle of juniper and scraggly pine and sagebrush, and for some reason, that landscape gave me an eerie feeling. It felt so different from the southwest Ponderosa forest that I was used to. About two months into the job, I started hearing something walking and scratching on the deck at night. Sometimes it even sounded like it was scratching on the door. The area was known for its wood rat, so I chalked it up to that. Whenever I went to check it out, nothing was there. I assumed they scurried away when I opened up the door. Then I started finding these dismembered bats. Sometimes they were torn in half, but mostly I'd just find their wings on my deck. I've always been a relaxed person, so the fact that I was feeling so edgy was out of character for me. Whenever I'd leave the cabin at night, 
I had this eerie feeling like I was being watched. One night, I was getting back from my shopping run that I did once a week. While I was parking, I suddenly got this bad feeling. At the time, I didn't have my shotgun in the vehicle. I got out of the truck and was hit by this heavy smell. It was like a mix of wet dog and this super concentrated urine smell. I went around to the passenger side to get my groceries. I looked to the left of the cabin and saw these two glowing eyes about 50 feet from my front door. They looked to be about five or six feet in the air. I was freaked out to say the least. I started yelling, get the hell out of here, but the eyes just crouched lower down. I assumed it might be a bobcat or a mountain lion, but I wouldn't normally associate that scent with a big cat, so it seemed odd. I threw a piece of wood toward it, and it leapt back a bit, but it didn't make any sound. I threw three or four more pieces at it, and it retreated a little further back. At this point, I abandoned the groceries and started fumbling with my keys. I made a mad dash to the front door and managed to get inside and get my shotgun. When I came out, the eyes looked a little bit closer. I couldn't get a good look at it though. It was out of range of the porch light. I didn't want to shoot it if I didn't have to. I held the shotgun and I kept throwing pieces of wood with one hand. Finally, it walked away into the brush. I waited for a good 10 or 15 minutes before I rushed to get my groceries and get back inside. I eventually calmed down enough to make dinner. I kept the shotgun right beside me. I couldn't imagine what was attracting it to my deck. I kept the place clean and was obsessive about not having a trace of food around. A couple of hours later, I was sitting at the table reading and I heard that scratching sound again. This time, I could swear I also heard this low growling sound. By then, I was feeling like a nervous wreck. It felt like this thing was stalking me. I went to the window and raised the blinds about an inch and looked out. I assumed it saw the movement because when I looked out, it had its back to me and was heading off the deck. I just froze when I saw this bipedal monster over six feet tall. It wasn't a cat at all. It looked like an upright canine creature with this humped back and massive shoulders. The legs almost looked human, but were huge and the knees were all weird like a dog's. I was just shocked at the size. When it got about 20 feet away, it turned around and I saw the face of this demonic looking wolf. I was shaking so bad, but I managed to open the window a crack and was ready to shoot it right through the screen. It shot off into the darkness like a rocket. I've never seen something that big move that fast. My mind had no reference point for an animal like that. I slept on the couch with my shotgun that night. I'm sure I woke up at least every hour thinking I heard something. In the morning, a trail crew came up and we found huge tracks on the porch and leading away from the cabin. Huge canine tracks with long claws. After that night, I always thought I heard scratching on the deck, but never found tracks. I was afraid I was losing it. As soon as possible, I got transferred to the main guard station, where I could be around co-workers a lot of the time. But eventually, I convinced my parents to move to Arizona, and I went back to the park I was familiar with. I just couldn't take that kind of stress. Hi Donovan. I'm married, so sometimes my wife and I will go visit her home state. She's mourning the loss of her parents, and it just relieves her to see a familiar face. We go fairly often, at least twice a year. She loves to get a few things from there, stuff you wouldn't be able to get where we live. And sometimes we like to go to the family home and fish in the river out back. We had done our rounds a few weeks ago and we were on our way home when we saw something that was hard to make sense of. My wife grew up in a very superstitious culture. I, on the other hand, not so much. I'm very much a person of facts and reason. I guess that's what makes my story all the more unusual. We were driving through a part of the state before crossing back into our town. That weekend was so windy that we didn't fish once. I actually brought all the night crawlers back for our grandkids' turtles. Anyways, the wind was wild and it was snowing. We always try to beat the snow this time of year, but I guess that didn't work out either. This part of the state is very flat. So between the fallen snow and sky, the place was almost entirely white. Now, I say almost because there was something else out there. There was something walking upright off in the distance. I thought my eyes were fooling me, but my wife must have seen it too, because she stopped talking. 
It was tall and thin and dark. And as we got closer to this entity, I'm not sure what else to call it. I could clearly see that it was wearing a pointed black hat and some type of blue shawl over its shoulders. They were struggling to walk against the wind. I mean, it was blowing pretty hard. And they continued walking through the harshness of it all. I was pretty impressed. But that's when nothing started to make much sense. Who was this person? Why were they walking in the middle of nowhere? And why were they doing it in this type of weather? Now, let me make this very clear. This part of the state is desolate. It's flat. It's rural. There's not a sign of civilization for miles. Yet this person, whoever they are, was walking through it as if they were on a mission. I don't know what it could have possibly been, but I wanted to make sure I could identify them as a person, as if anything else was an option. To me, it wasn't, right? My wife started to get uncomfortable. I could tell. All she kept saying was, what is that? I didn't know how to respond. How could I? I couldn't even understand what I was seeing. The questions kept coming. What is that? But I just kept thinking, who is that? My wife instructed me to keep going so we could get as close of a look as we could. I didn't want to tell her that I had already planned to do so because I was just as curious as she was. If I had, it might have made her more scared because I'm not usually the type to get curious. As we move forward through the snow and the wind, which by the way got louder as we approached the traveler, we were able to get a better look. It had this tall pointed hat and a blue shawl, but we couldn't see the face. Something told me I needed to see that face. I had to. There was no other option. I'm not sure why this was so important to me. Seeing the face of something that looked like an insane person traveling through the snow. I had to. And not long after I thought about this, my wife uttered, We have to see their face. We continued to drive and soon we were looking close enough to see the face of whoever or whatever this thing was. I looked across my wife and out through her window on the passenger side. My wife was looking as well. Chills ran through me. I didn't think I could get much colder, but I did. And the hair stood up on my arms and my neck and my back. As we passed this stranger, we looked out. And as we looked out, the individual looked in. They were looking right at us. The best way I can describe the face of this person, or whatever you want to call it, is that it was all black. I'm not sure if it was painted black or, or if the person was wearing some type of mask, but their face was completely black. All I could see were the eyes, those eyes peering back at us. No other features could be seen. Not a nose, not a mouth. This faceless person, whoever they were, was just as interested in us as we were of it, and that is probably the most frightening part of all of it. I thought to myself, all right, this person has an unusual mask, but that doesn't make the situation unusual. But my wife, she was still frozen stiff, she was hardly moving. So we pass this individual and keep driving, and just as I start to see them in my rearview mirror, I notice their path changes. They're no longer walking the same way as they were before. Instead, they began walking behind the car, like they were crossing the road. So I start to wonder, what are they doing? The only reasonable thing that crossed my mind at the time is that maybe they were looking for a roadkill. Now, why were they looking for roadkill was a whole different can of worms I did not want to open, but it made the most sense, and I was relatively content with it. But that's when things got more bizarre. The person crossed the road. Both my wife and I are watching them. They make it across the road, and in an instant, they vanish. Again, this is flat land, as flat as you can get, and the terrain is completely white. So where did they go? Who were they? Why was their face black with no nose and no mouth? What were they doing out in the middle of the desert in the snow? I can't answer any of this. I'm still trying to make sense of it all. Last summer, I'd gone to a family reunion in Lake Tahoe for a weekend. I ended up getting on the road really late to drive home. I do live in Nevada, but east of Tahoe in a town called Fallon. It's about an hour and a half drive from Tahoe. I had to drive home that night because I had to be back for work the next day. The drive was along Highway 50, which is known as the loneliest road in America. It goes through a lot of the desolate desert area and is boring to say the least. 
I had been driving about 45 minutes, and I was starting to get really tired. I felt this sleepiness coming on, and I could tell it was going to get really hard to fight. I don't know if you've heard of microsleep, but sometimes you can fall asleep for like 30 seconds at a time, and you don't even know you've been asleep. It's obviously really dangerous if it happens while you're driving. It used to happen to me more often than I care to admit, because I was working two jobs and was always sleep deprived. I tried playing loud music and sticking my head out the window. I tried just yelling at myself over and over again, but my brain wasn't having it and I just felt so drowsy. I knew I needed to take a break, but I didn't feel safe just pulling over right on the side of the road. I finally came to this old dirt road that headed off to the right. So I turned and drove to this little stand of bushes and tried to conceal my car a bit. I don't even know why I was so paranoid, but I felt like I'd attract unwanted attention from the few other cars that had been passing. I looked at the clock and saw that it was 11.33, and then I fell asleep. A while later, this scratching sound partially woke me up. It was like this metallic sound, like something was scratching the car. I looked at the clock and it was 12.07. The sound stopped after a few seconds, and I was still half asleep, so I didn't even really look around. I just went back to sleep. I was later awakened by the same sound, and it was 12.57. This time, it started worrying me because the sound didn't stop. The thought ran across my mind that it was just an animal inspecting the car. But why would it come back almost an hour after it had left the previous time? I was trying to wake up all the way, but I just couldn't. Then, inside of my head, I felt like it started vibrating really loud. It was almost painful, but not quite. And then it turned into this high-pitched ring that was about the loudest sound I'd heard in my life. I opened my window and was hit with this strong smell of sulfur. For some reason, I thought that meant I was near a hot spring or something. The scratching had stopped by then. I turned on my headlights, and in front of my car, I saw a small group of strange humanoid creatures. They were about four feet tall. They were standing in a triangular shape, and the one in front was slightly taller than the others. The ringing in my head was making me feel like I couldn't think straight. The taller one stepped forward and stared into my eyes. It had these black eyes. Everything about them was black. The pupils, the retinas, the part that should be white was black. The skin on the face seemed almost bumpy. But while I was watching it, it seemed to be almost plastic, like glossy looking. The creatures were sort of holographic and bluish gray in color, and they were able to fade in and out of visibility. It looked like a steam or mist was rising from them. I immediately got goosebumps all over my back. It was steadily gazing at me, and the stare seemed to go on for days. I felt all the knowledge I had in me was being sucked out, like my whole consciousness was being read. Then, all of a sudden, I was blinded by a flash of light, like someone had taken a picture of me with this really bright flash. And then I felt completely drained. I had no energy. My soul felt hollow, and the beings were no longer in front of me. I looked at my rearview mirror and just managed to catch a glimpse of something running away behind me. It actually seemed more like figures made of light were drifting away behind my car. I fully expected to see some kind of spaceship or something, but there was nothing like that around as far as I could see. At least, I finally felt completely awake and thought to myself, I have to get the hell out of here. I started the car and got back on the road, and as I headed east again, I saw that the sun was starting to rise. I looked at my clock and saw it was almost 6 a.m. I had lost about five hours since I last checked my clock. For months, I questioned my sanity and reality. I knew I couldn't tell anyone, but when I found your channel, I felt like I had to say something, and it's just a real relief to be able to speak about this to someone. I've heard about some strange things happening out in the desert, and I think I've seen some strange lights in the sky out there, but what happened to me that night was really up close and personal. I will never feel the same again. When I think back on this experience, it seems like something completely surreal that couldn't possibly have happened. But listening to some of the other things I hear on this channel reminds me that I'm not crazy. I grew up in Kentucky on a horse breeding farm, so my love of horses runs deep. When I was out of high school, 
I knew that I wanted to pursue something that involved working with those horses. A lot of my friends wanted to go into veterinary medicine, but that didn't sound right for me. I knew I wanted to work in more of an outdoor setting. I decided to take a year off before starting college, and while I was traveling around the country, I came across something that sounded perfect for me. I was visiting Yosemite National Park and found out they had mounted park rangers. It sounded like a dream come true to ride horses around most of the day. I ended up taking the coursework to become a law enforcement ranger, and then eventually I was able to get a position at Yosemite as a mounted patrol ranger. Since I had extensive experience with horses, a big part of my job involved caring for them and training them. It was great as I thought it would be. The horses are involved in a lot of different aspects of the park, especially law enforcement and search and rescue. Some of them are also used in educational programs. Also, visitors can hire some of them for backcountry riding. My days started really early, usually around 6 a.m. I would have to get there early to groom them and feed them. They would usually be looking out for me and expecting their measure of oats and their flakes of hay. A flake of hay is just what we call a portion of the bale. The portions are measured out so that we know how much they're getting. One morning, I was half asleep, and I went out to fling hay over the fences. I got surprised by the sound of geese flapping around the horse trough. I had never seen them over there before, so I wasn't expecting all of that honking and flapping first thing. I had to take a quick pause to gather myself while I kept tossing the hay. For the first time, I noticed the horses hadn't come toward me to get that hay that they were usually whining for. They were just staying huddled together under the shelter. I went over to the gate so that I could go inside and check on them. The gate latch had been getting rusty, so I had been securing it with a piece of wire. But I saw that the wire was missing, and the gate was open about an inch, as if something had gained access. That really had me worried because there was no way someone would have come out there earlier than me. I went over to the horses to give them some nose rubs, which they usually love, but I could see that they were feeling pretty nervous. I had brought the oats in with me and held out some in my hand, but the horses wouldn't touch it. Weirdly, the geese were still hanging around out by the horse's water trough. I couldn't understand what they were doing in the horse corral. I started feeling a little creeped out. I went back out of the gate and started looking around, and my eyes caught some movement. It looked like something detached itself from the landscape behind the stables. I saw this huge thing appear. It had a very large head that, I kid you not, reminded me of a dinosaur. No hair, just a big lizardy head. It was standing on two legs. It turned toward me and looked right at me. It had these reptilian yellow eyes. All I remember about its face were the eyes and the sharp teeth. Like I said, I was standing upright, and it was probably about six or seven feet tall. I was about 30 feet away from it, and it was hard to tell, but it looked like it had grayish scaly skin. When it locked eyes on me, it reacted. It kind of shifted, or like took a little step to the side, like it was surprised that I had seen it. This feeling of fear and dread washed over me and it was paralyzing. I can still feel the feeling of my heart beating like crazy in my chest. I've never felt fear like that in my life since. I also felt a heaviness in my head. I don't know how to describe it any other way. The thing felt evil. After being immobilized by fear for what seemed like forever, but was probably only about 10 seconds, I turned and ran back to the horses. I would have run the hell away from there, but my first instinct was to protect the animals. As soon as I did that, it turned and ran up the hill, faster than anything I've ever seen. I eventually sounded the alarm and some other rangers showed up. They wanted to follow after it on horseback, but the horses wouldn't go. I'd never seen them disobey like that, and they wouldn't eat for hours after that. I cannot imagine what that thing wanted. It couldn't have been after the oats and the hay. When I thought about the possibility that it had gotten in the gate and gone near them, I just felt sick. But I looked them over really carefully, and they seemed physically unharmed. We started locking the horses inside the stable at night after that. Of course, when I went to make my report, they tried to get me to think I saw a mountain lion or something. 
But no effing way was that a normal creature. This is embarrassing, but we should probably get it out of the way. It's important to the story, I think. I used to go by Monster Bone 75. I realize now that it doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. I've since changed my username. If you were a part of any online cryptid forums in the mid to late 2000s though, you might recognize that name. You might remember seeing Monsterbone75 on AOL Instant Messenger with an away message that accused your favorite cryptid of needing to use my house phone. The limitations of dial-up internet would make for its own horror story, don't you think? For years, I went by Bones on the online cryptid communities. I wasn't anyone's favorite person, though. I was a skeptic. I was never saying, I found the Bones, or I know the Bones are out there. I was the guy asking the question, if these species really do exist, where are their bones? It didn't earn me the greatest reputation. It cost me a few friends, I'm sure. I got addicted to shutting down the theories of others. I'd log in to comb the boards for questions from curious newcomers or for encounter stories from the most reputable of our members. I'd spend an hour, sometimes hours, cramming my skepticism into my keyboard and across the web. That behavior got me banned from a few locations. I didn't care. Getting kicked out of those communities felt like a trophy at the time. You can see why, all these years later, admitting to all of that might be a little embarrassing, especially since I've seen the bones myself. I had the opportunity to hike to Crater Lake in the spring of 2018. I'm not from the Pacific Northwest, so the chance to see a new part of the country at my age wasn't something I could just pass up. It might be the single most beautiful part of the United States. The clarity of the water, history of the collapsed volcano that formed the lake beds, it's magical. The last thing on my mind when we set up camp three miles northeast of Cleetwood Cave was the years that I had wasted harassing conspiracy theorists on the internet. I was still entranced by the beauty of the world around us. Then, after sunset, I was hypnotized all over again by the sea of stars that waited for us. My friend and I spent a long while by the campfire before retiring to our tents. The ground was pretty stiff, but it was still easy for me to sleep. We'd learn later that we both woke around the same time. There was this low growl outside of my tent. I could barely hear it, but I could feel it in my chest. I woke and the hairs of my arms were already standing on end. Something heavy shifted its feet in the dirt outside my tent. I heard slow breathing and a heavy snort. I read about what to do in a bear attack. I couldn't remember a single word at that moment. If it was a bear, I thought, I was done for. Even when I was stricken by that fear, I felt this trip was worth it. At least I got to see Crater Lake, I remember thinking. Then came the sound of a few quick strides. The low growl, the breathing, it was all suddenly gone. I didn't hear the animal's feet hit the ground more than three times, and it had still cleared our camp completely. There was no sign of it among the trees when I unzipped my tent and stepped outside. My friend was out there too. It was his ghost white expression that drew my attention to the dirt. I followed his eyes and I found it. All around our campsite was patterns of tracks, shaped like a foot of a man or an ape. One print was so close to the entrance of my tent that I could already compare it to the size of my own feet. I could stand heel to toe and still not cover that whole track. All of my years as a skeptic came rushing back to me. I imagine, as I looked down at the impossible footprint, that I was overcome by the same compulsion that motivated all those believers on those message boards. I needed to know. My friend had already started packing up. I ran in the direction of those tracks instead. I tried to stay low and quiet, but if I'm being honest, I'm no hunter. I'm sure the beast knew I was coming. If that's the case, then it let me close in. I spotted it between the trees. The hulking hairy shape was illuminated well by the sky full of stars. I ducked behind this tree and hoped that the trunk would protect me from any sort of retaliation. To my surprise, the massive ape-like thing didn't turn to face me. It was staring at the ground, working a crooked tree branch across the ground like a rake. Seeing the animal use a tool was terrifying enough. That meant it couldn't be far from human. 
I crept in a circle around the animal, scaling a short hill to get a better view of the dirt it was tilling. That was when I realized what the monster was doing. There was another one. Whatever this massive ape-like creature was, it wasn't an anomaly. There was another one of those beasts, laying in a grave at the feet of the monster I'd followed. Tools and burial rituals. My heart dropped into my stomach. I ran again, this time back toward the campsite. There was a roar behind me. Was it a roar or a howl? I couldn't have imagined it. It started low, then rose into this shrill three barking yelps, and then it trailed off. The sound spread a heat in my gut like lightning. I was sure the animal was going to follow me back and punish me for what I had seen. It wasn't until we were in the car that I told my friend what was out there. He didn't believe me. I went online and tried to share my story. As you can imagine, I wasn't the most reliable source of new information. I'm writing you now to explain to a present theory that maybe you haven't considered. All these sightings of cryptids, I know you've asked the same questions that I have. Maybe we haven't found that single piece of irrefutable proof because they're smart enough to hide it from us. Small towns come with their own dirty little secrets, and my hometown is no different. Located about 30 minutes south of Oklahoma City, a tiny blink and you'll miss it type of town exists. Slaughterville is literally a convenience store, a few housing additions, and like four intersections big. But it's home to crazy insane stories like the one I'm about to tell you. No one ever really wants to talk about this to outside people. We get tired of getting laughed and made fun of. I'm going to tell you anyway. Believe me if you want, but at least hear me out. It was back in 2015. I had just moved back and I was staying with my aunt and her family while I was looking for my own place. I wasn't thrilled with staying in Slaughterville, but beggars can't be choosers or whatever the saying is. I enjoyed being outside during the day. It was always fun to watch the kids on dirt bikes and four-wheelers race up and down the red dirt road. But after dark, that is a whole other monster and one I didn't enjoy. We spent most of our time hanging out on the porch laughing at the shenanigans and watching the kids play. But once the sun started to set, we all headed back inside and hid out. We avoided the outside as much as we could after dark. On this night in particular, my girlfriend drove down to see me. I asked her to be there before dark, but her work held her up. I wasn't overly comfortable with hanging out in the car after dark, but I went ahead and gave in. We had been outside for about 45 minutes when I could feel the energy around us change. The air got thick and felt electric. I shifted uncomfortably in my seat. I was getting really anxious. Of course, she just kept talking. She had no idea the kind of weird things that happened out here, especially after dark. I kept looking around the car as she chatted. I was trying to follow along, but honestly, I was distracted. I was really anxious. Something was off. I watched in horror as a young woman appeared in front of our car. She was gorgeous and wore this old hospital gown. She looked completely normal, except for the fact that she was glowing faintly. I gasped and pointed ahead of us out of the window. My girlfriend covered her mouth and watched as this girl floated closer to the car until she was right in front of the bumper. We just watched silently as she raised her arm and reached behind her head. She pulls out this giant knife from her back, and it was stained red. I looked at my girlfriend in the seat next to me and grabbed her. I knew that nothing was going to happen to us, but I was still terrified. She kept her eyes glued to the spot in front of us. I turned back around and watched as this girl looked at us and started crying. She was begging for our help. My girlfriend started to open the door to get out, but I grabbed it and yanked it shut. We could not get out and interact with whatever this thing was. As the girl realized that we weren't going to help, she got angry, and the tears stopped. She pointed the knife at us and started screaming, but the screams were wrong. They came in waves, and I had to let go of the door and cover my ears. We stayed in the car, listening to this girl scream at us until she simply vanished. One second she was there, and the next she was gone. My girlfriend looked at me, eyes wide and panicked. I just reached out and pulled her into a hug. 
I was freaked out, even though I knew what happened out there. I couldn't imagine how she was feeling. We decided that maybe it was time for her to wrap up her visit and for her to head back to the city. We said our goodbyes and I made sure that I let her know not to stop for any hitchhikers on the way out of town. Don't even stop if you see someone walking on the road. Just drive by them. Picking up hitchhikers isn't safe in general, but definitely not out here. She agreed and she headed home, but it was only five minutes before I got a frantic call. She was clearly panicking as she told me that at the stop sign there was an older woman in a gown walking toward her car. I told her to lock their doors and not to look at her, just drive. I stayed on the phone with her, trying to calm her down. Once she had turned out of the neighborhood and back onto the road to the highway, she noticed a black shadow following her. I let her know, just keep driving, but my blood ran cold. I could hear the fear in her voice as she told me whatever it was behind them was keeping up even as they sped back to the highway. I promised to stay on the phone even as she went in and out of service, making sure that I kept my voice calm. I know the creatures that live out here, but this figure didn't make sense to me. As she described it to me, I tried to keep as calm as I could. It was a black shadow with no eyes. It appeared in the shape of a tall man, seven or eight feet tall and was fast. She was easily doing 80 and this thing was constantly in a rear view mirror. It followed her until she hit Norman city limits when it growled low and deep and suddenly disappeared. And only then did we feel safe enough to hang up. We still don't know exactly what followed her, but she isn't the only one to experience being followed. I have so many more stories I could tell, but we will just leave it with this one for now.